if you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, as we continue our study in the book of Acts, the history of uh, the local church, the early church, Acts chapter 5, we're going to begin in reading in verse number 5. Once you find your place, I invite you to stand as we honor God with the reading of his word. Acts 5, verse 5. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon them all, upon them that heard of these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what had done what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much? And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Let's pray. Father, as we are once again, Lord, to the preaching and teaching part of the service. Father, I ask once again that you would empty me of myself. Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin, and that you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit, that I may preach, thus saith the word of the Lord. Father, I ask this morning... Lord, that you would help every single person here and those that are watching. Lord, that we would not allow Satan to distract us with anything. Lord, that you would bind him. Father, I ask this morning that you would bless this message. Lord, and if there's someone here that's not saved, Lord, if they're not sure if they died today, or when they died, that heaven would be their home. Father, I ask this morning that they would get that settled this morning before they leave. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would convict us through the preaching of thy word this morning. Help us, I pray, and ask that you do these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. And may God bless the reading of his word. Last week we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, so we're not going to I'm not going to re uh, re-preach that message. I wanted to read verses five through ten to kind of give uh if you weren't here last week a backstory of verses eleven through sixteen. We talked about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, what happened? 
uh, how that they lied to God, that they both agreed to lie to God about how much they sold the land for. We talked about that they didn't have to sell the land. It was about their choice to sell the land. And they may, they lie, they sinned against God by uh, conniving together to tell the church that they sold the land for the amount that they brought, which it was that they kept some back. And they didn't even have to give the whole price that they, uh, of the land because they didn't have to sell it. And not only did they not have to give the whole price, they should have been honest with the Lord and said, well, we sold it for this much, but we're giving this much, which would have been fine. The whole issue was, was that they lied to God and they sinned uh, to God because of their lying. And so today we're going to talk about the aftermath of the Lord's judgment. The aftermath of the Lord's judgment because whether you or I or anyone care to recognize or do recognize that when we sin, we know that God is going to judge that sin, but there is an aftermath. There is consequences for our sin. And we talked about last week that God was doing a great work in the church, and Ananias and Sapphira disrupted that work with what they did. And if you and I were honest with ourselves and with the Lord, there are times that we disrupt the work of God in the Garth Road Baptist Church. We're in church this morning. This is going to be a somber message, but this is a much needed message. Because as I talked about in the book of Judges, how Israel had Canaanized themselves and not separated themselves from the Canaanites. Church today, we have done the same thing with the world. We have Canaanized ourselves with the world. We, we do the same things of the world. There, listen, there are and I'm talking about church in general. I'm, I, I'm put lumping us all together. There are churches all across this country and this world who have members who are lost. The church is not to have members that are lost. If you're not saved, you can't be a member of the church. It's Bible. We, do I need to go back to chapter 4? And rehash this. And so, again, if we're honest, we have, there are church members and believers who have unrepentant sin who hinder God's work in the church today. And I'm, I'm including the Garth Road Baptist Church because we are all human. We all have that sin nature. And there's a lot of times that we do not want to deal with that sin. Because there's a lot of sins that we do in private that other folks don't know about. This, this was public. And Ananias and Sapphira was public, right? And God dealt with them in public. And so, even though God, this was something in public that uh, that with, with Peter as he was talking to them, that God dealt with them in public... The aftermath of what happened with God's judgment of their sin was also public. Because, folks, the Lord will judge sin. We know he judged sin with Jesus, right? God, the Lord, God, the Father, he judged sin with Jesus. Jesus was our propitiation. He was our substitute. God, uh, Jesus laid our sin on himself. God turned his back on Jesus. God laid, uh, sin, uh, our, you know, dealt with sin with Jesus. But even though God had de dealt with, uh, with our sin with Jesus, even though we still sin today, God still, the Lord still judges our sin. 
or we're going to look at some verses this morning in the New Testament church, in the New Testament dealing with churches of how God dealt with sin, how the Lord dealt with sin. One way we see in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira is he judges sin swiftly and directly. God dealt with Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira swiftly, did he not? As soon as they lied, they told Peter and the Holy Spirit, now Peter is not God, he is not the Pope, so... We know that's not the case, but when he, when Ananias lied to Peter and lied to the Holy Spirit, God judged Ananias and his wife Sapphira swiftly and directly. Because we see that, that verse 11, and great fear came upon the church and upon as many as heard these things. Here the church sees God's judgment publicly and they know why Ananias and Sapphira died. They, the church knows exactly why both of them dropped dead at, at church. You know, there's a lot of times that the church doesn't know why folks are going through things. Now, I'm not saying everything that we go through, every trial that we go through is because of sin, but there are things that po folks go through because of sin. Because God judges them. Here, the church saw publicly what God did in judging their sin. Let's, take, let's look at the church of Corinth, one of the most confused and carnal churches that we have we see in the New Testament. You remember when Paul was talking to them about the Lord's table? There were many of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that were abusing the Lord's table. They were taking or partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. Either they were unsaved or they were not taking the Lord's table correctly by not taking time to get right with the Lord before they took, before they took part of the Lord's table. And many were sick. With the Lord, the Bible says weak and some died because of their lack of integrity in taking the Lord's table because of their sin. And Paul told them about it. You have folks that are weak and uh, who are dying, who have died because of their lack of getting right with God. They were carnal. And so Paul t calls them out, the church out in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul tells them that they, the reason they did that is because of their sin in the way they chose to partake of the Lord's table. So he judges swiftly and directly. You know, the Lord also judges slowly and indirectly in Romans chapter 1. We, if you look in Romans chapter 1, it talks about the lost, how the, that God had given folks over to a reprobate mind. Because they were doing things that they were not supposed to do. They knew that they were supposed to do because Romans 1 talks about the law society. And I was looking at my memory, uh, you know, we can go on Facebook and look at memory. Uh, and I said, Romans chapter 1 describes the American society today. God gave them over to a reprobate mind and he, he judged them slowly and indirectly where he gives them over uh, to... Uh, being uh, uh, to being a reprobate, he judges swiftly and directly, slowly and indirectly, and he also judges. In the scriptures, or, he's organized. Let's turn to Matthew chapter eighteen, real quick. Matthew chapter eighteen. And look at verse number 15. Matthew 18, 15. 
Here as Jesus is talking, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two, uh, one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an, un, uh, as an heathen man and a publican. Uh, verily I say unto you, who, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and who, whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So we see here he uses the church to discipline and judge sin. But the problem is in today's church, we cast out Matthew 18. Instead of doing what the Lord has told us to do in Matthew 18, we don't want to say something that would cause this brother or sister to leave the church. Because after all, God, Jesus is love. I'm being facetious right there, okay? And it, did you notice verse 20? You know, we, 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 we love to take verse 20 out of context. We always say, well, when two or three are gathered together, there he is. In the context of church discipline, yes. Context is everything. And so, we don't take Matthew 18 instead of when someone sins publicly, that, we, that others of the church know about it, instead of them going, someone going to that person and saying something to that person, and if that person decides not to change or not to admit and repent and get right with the Lord, then... That person needs to take two other people, one to two other people with them to confront that person. And if they don't decide to repent and get right with the Lord, then those folks need to bring that to the church. And the church needs to be known, and the church needs to execute church discipline. And let me help you out, folks. Church discipline is not about pushing folks out. Church discipline is about repentance. Church discipline is about getting whoever it is that is having to submit to church discipline to understand their sin against God and to bring them back into a fellowship with God. But in so, they, well, you know, in church discipline, it, 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 you do have to execute that church discipline and but the, we, we see here that we, there's a way to execute this organ, uh, in Scripture uh, organized. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 18. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 real quick. I'm going to be quick about it. 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul talks about this, of course, Church of Corinth, a very carnal church. And there's something going on in the church that should not be going on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul here, he writes, It is reported commonly, I mean that multiple folks know about this, that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He says, it's reported commonly that you got somebody in the church that wants their father's wife. And he's saying, listen, what's reported, this, this is unheard of in the lost. Lost folks don't do this. He goes, and you are puffed up, you're prideful. 
and have not and have rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in the spirit, have judged already, and though I were present concerning him that hath done so done this deed. And look at this, and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, he, again, to the church of Corinth, since you got a guy who's wanting his father's wife and you're so prideful that you won't do anything about it. And Paul says, I've judged him already. Being an apostle, he judges him already. And he says, in the name of our Lord, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he goes, in the name of Jesus Christ, when, I, when you gather together and in my spirit, you need to execute judgment to this guy and, 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 need to tell, and ask that the Lord will take him, kill him, that his spirit would be saved so that he doesn't cause any more problems. He says, church, you need to take, you need to take care of business. He goes, you're, he goes, this sin, this fornication that's going on, it's, it's not even reported in the lost. And so Paul uses the church in the church of Corinth to, to execute judgment in an organized fashion. And the Lord, when he judges sin, he judges it finally. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 30, the Lord will execute final judgment over his enemies. So listen, the Lord will judge sin. And he's not just saying that he will judge sin in the lost. He will judge sin in the church. Because remember, church, what threw man into, into depravity? Disobeying God by eating one piece of fruit. If we, disobeying God by eating one piece of fruit threw man into depravity and it cost him his one and only son to die on the cross for mankind, God still takes sin seriously. And just because we're in the age of grace and we are in the, what we call the church age does not give us an excuse. God still judges sin. We see in, in these various verses that we have read that God judges sin, that the Lord will judge sin. So what is what was the aftermath of the Lord's judgment here with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? The first thing we're going to see in verse 11 on the aftermath is that great fear came upon the church and upon as many as heard these things. So the first thing we see in the aftermath is fear, reverence unto the Lord came. Folks, there should be fear, respect, and reverence of the Lord in his church. Amen? There should be there is and there should be a reverence and a fear for the Lord in his church. But Ananias and Sapphira, did they have fear and reverence for the Lord? No. Why? Because they were willingly, willing to lie to the Lord and to his church. For what they had done was sin. They were willing to lie. They did not have fear. You 
You know, the wicked have no fear of the Lord. In Psalms 36, verses 1 through 4, this is what David says. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For, the, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to, be good, and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in, in, a, in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. The wicked have no fear of the Lord. You want to know if whether you're saved or not? What is your? Do you have fear of the Lord? That's a good measuring stick to whether you're saved or not. Not only if you're saved or not, but if you're backslidden. If you're backslidden, you have no fear for the consequences of your sin. You see, the righteous have fear. Proverbs 16, 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. See, the righteous fear the Lord. They have respect and reverence unto the Lord. So the first thing we see here is fear. It says, not only fear came, fear came upon the church. There were those in the church that feared the Lord. And not only in the church, but it also says those that were not in the church. It says, and upon as many as heard these things. So the first thing we see in uh, what happened uh, with uh, uh, the aftermath is fear. Folks, there ought to be fear of the Lord in the church. Second thing we see in verses 12 and verses 15 and 16 is there is God's power. Folks were added to the church and folks uh, tried to get their family members in the path of the church's spiritual leaders. Look at verse number 12. And, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, talking about they had unity. And verse 14, and believers were... Uh, were the more added to the Lord multi multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on, the on, on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about to Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed everyone and so we see here God has showed the church he expects purity and in turn he gives power in the ministry what happened with this with God's power folks were added to the church and folks uh, tried to get their family members in the path of the church's spiritual leaders it's, it, it, it says that there were even folks trying to bring in their family members to the streets and laying them on beds and couches that they thought that even if Peter would pass by, that his shadow would heal. The Bible doesn't say that it did happen. They assumed it would happen. Not only that, others were bringing from out within the city, bringing their family members, their sick, to them and they were healed everyone listen god expects purity in the church and if you if you're going to have power in the church and not just in the church what i mean by in the church in every single one of your lives if you want to have power the power of god in your life you must be pure what do you mean must be pure you must get right deal with your sin Great fear came, reverence came, fear and reverence came upon the church and others that were outside the church. Not only that, but God gave great power to do the ministry. Because why? Sin had been purged. 
Ananias and Sapphira were dealt with. Listen, you want, you want the power of God in your life? You better make a short account with, with your sin to God. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in, great house, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Paul was telling Timothy, listen, you need to make sure you make sure to count with sin. You need to purge yourself. That way you are meat for the master's use. You are a vessel of honor. Someone God can use in the ministry. Because isn't that what we're here to do? To reach folks? To be a vessel of honor for God and uh, to, for him to use us in, this, in our community? Is that not what we're here for? We're not just some social group that comes in and enjoys one another's company and leaves. No, we are the church of God. And if we're the church of God, we best be acting like the church of God. And deal with our sins. The third thing we see in the aftermath of the Lord's judgment of sin, there is distinction. There is distinction. Look at verse 13. And of the rest, talk about those that are lost, there's no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them said the lost didn't want to have anything to do with them. But not only did they not want to have to do with them, we're not talking about isolationists here. We're talking about they respected the church, it says, but they magnified them. There was a clear distinction between the world and the church. The lost had nothing to do with the church, but the lost respected the church And because they respected the church, look at verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men, of men and women. Great evangelism was being done because multitudes of the lost were being saved. Folks, the lost don't want, the lost aren't going to hear you if you act just like they do. When you have no testimony to the lost, you're not going to win the lost. But if you have a testimony, you have that opportunity. I know I'm nobody. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I'm thankful that I have a testimony at work. People, I have associates that will come to me. Can you pray for me? Can you, they'll ask me questions and I'm able to try to help them. Do you think they'd come to me if I, said the same colorful words as they said? Think they'd come to me if I said the same jokes and liked the same things that they do? No. I'm at work to be a testimony for the Lord. To win folks to the Lord. 
So there was a clear distinction here. In the aftermath of the Lord judging sin. So what was the aftermath of the Lord judging sin in the church? The aftermath is still the same as it was in the early church. Folks, the aftermath is still the same. When God's way of dealing with sin is respected in the church and carried out the discipline of sin, the aftermath will be the same. What's the result? Reverence for the Lord, power for the ministry, and a distinction between the church and the world. Folks, this is the most important and powerful instrument we have in the church. The church is to preach it. Amen? The church is to preach this book. The church is to obey this book. Come on again. You agree you're supposed to not only preach it, but you're supposed to obey it. And you know what the church is also supposed to do? Apply this book. Preach it, obey it, apply it. If we do those things, we'll have the same results that the early church had. If we don't, we won't. Folks, we can spin our tires. We can do all kinds of things. But if we're not preaching the word, obeying the word, and applying the word, we will not reach our community for Christ. That is the mission of the church. Right? Our mission is to preach the gospel to every creature, disciple them, baptize them, and disciple them. If we are not preaching the word and we are not obeying the word and we are not applying the word, we cannot fulfill our mission. Why? Because we don't have, enough, we don't have the fear of the Lord. We don't have the power of the Lord. And there is no distinction between us and them. You might be here this morning. You know you're lost. You know that if you were to die today, you know that heaven would not be your home. You've been playing church for maybe weeks, uh, years, decades. And you know for sure that if you were to die today, if God were to take your life, you know for sure that you would go to hell because you're not dealing with your sin. Instead of coming to Christ and receiving Him as your Savior, placing your faith in Him, instead you're going to try, You're just going to keep pushing that down the road, and then when one day, as, as 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 my cousin said, when I get older, I will. Listen, folks, you may not get older. There are two in two hundred yards away. There are folks dead that are infants all the way up. You are not guaranteed to get home. I'm not guaranteed to walk home. But I know that if God takes my life today, I'm going to heaven forever. Why? Because I have confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in my heart that God has raised him from the dead and I'm saved. I have placed my faith and my trust in Jesus. For my sin. The question is, why haven't you? There's no man made institution or device that man has created 
that will make you right between you and God. God's the only one that can do that. It's through Jesus Christ in, in Christ alone. Your baptism won't save you. Getting dunked won't save you. That's a symbol of what Christ has done in your heart. Giving to the church won't help you out. If you want to give, go ahead. We'll use it to print gospel tracts and to use it to further into the gospel message in our community. But it won't save you. Let me, let me help you out. Saying Hail Mary a hundred times ain't going to help you. Paying grievances won't help you. And the Bible says nothing about you being able to pray. It doesn't say anything about purgatory, nor does it say anything about you being able to pray somebody out of purgatory. The only thing that saves you from the penalty of your sin in hell is Jesus. you're placing your faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. See, God showed his love towards you, and while, you were yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we're sinners... God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you humble yourself finally? Receive the gift of God Jesus Christ, in the forgiving of your sins, to where you don't have to suffer eternal penalty for your sins. In a moment, we're going to have Miss Ruth come up and play the piano, and what we call we call it the invitation. Why? Because if you're not saved this morning, and you want to be saved. We invite you to come forward and allow us to help you and show you what God's word says about. Being saved.